the you brevity of time. They're usually. I'll look for them, Dan. So Paul's using an example of days and we, I was exposed to some people a few years ago that um, were, were going back and trying to live by the, the first five books of the Bible. And I don't, it's not a cult, but it's just like, well, okay, whatever. Um, it, it's, I don't know how they arrived at that, but you know, the Sabbath day was like super important to them. I get to tell you, Paul's view on this is all days are holy. Okay. It's not just one day. We're owned lock, stock, and barrel by God. All days are the Lord's. But again, is Paul trying to convince people uh, of his view? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. He, he's saying, listen, you can't have contempt for somebody that believes differently from you because it's a minor issue. So, so I, I rec even though I believe differently, I recognize there are those who believe differently from me, and I'm going to respect that view. You got to remember this. The Jewish Christians came in. Boy, they had the Sabbath. They had all types of Jewish festivals, new moons. They had all kind of days for religious observances. Um, the, the Gentiles who were coming in, who were coming out of pagan worship, certain of their days were holy days. Um, so you had all this confluence of opinions about what constitutes a holy day. And all Paul says is, at the end of the day, did he argue and try to convince who's right? No. He says, let each person be convinced in his own mind. Now, you can take this too far, but Paul is saying you leave it up to the conscience of the individual. Now, we are still the Lord's, and you're not using conscience as an excuse for doing something obvious and sinful. Something like, let's say, uh, Ned says, um, oh, why am I picking on Ned? Okay. He's a good sport. And he's probably on oxycodone anyway, so it's okay. Um, Ned, <laughs> Ned, Ned says, um, it's a conviction of my conscience that I need to go out and serial kill 27 people. Okay? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was a wild one. Um, this, what Paul is talking about is, is, convinced in your own mind or leaving it up to your own conscience has nothing to do with these major biblical issues. Paul is speaking of minor issues, things that are morally neutral. Now, what we do is we get, oh, but this isn't a minor issue. This isn't morally neutral. It's really important what day of the, work, of the year you worship on. It's really important what you eat and, and not eating meat and blah, blah, blah. And, and Paul goes, no. Nope stop it Sophie nope it isn't important it is not important it is not important a major issue is something like what we talked about that C.S. Lewis called mere Christianity the thing the glue that holds us all together there is a Jesus Christ he is the son of God he was born of a virgin birth he 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 took all, he lived a perfect life and he took all of your sins upon him. He was crucified and punished for all your sins. He was resurrected after three days. And because of that resurrection, you have resurrection, life and forgiveness of all your sins through him. Guys, those are the majors. I'm surprised I just rattled those off and I may have missed some, I don't know. But I think I got them. Everything else is minor and Paul says you should leave it to the conscience of the individual. Um, you know, on major issues, there's no room for individual opinions. Ned is wrong to want to go serial kill 27 people. And I can show him where in the Bible it says that. But if Ned only wants to go to a church that has a pipe organ, and in his mind, that's super critical, and he doesn't feel comfortable in any other church, and he thinks you know, maybe they're all going to hell, then you know what, Ned? There's churches out there with just have pipe organs. Go for it. My, we need to have, give each other latitude and room for differing views. 
You should live according to your convictions, Paul says. At no point did he try to convince you that eating meat is actually the correct way. He hints at it, calls the vegetarians weak, weak individuals, but he doesn't say, I try to change them. He says, no, don't look down your nose on them. And they shouldn't try to judge you. You guys all just do one thing, get along, seven and nine. For none of us, Paul says, lives to himself. No one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Remember what I said about who owns Ron? We are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be the Lord, the Lord of both the dead and the living. So referencing Christians, we have to begin understand that from the beginning to the end, our life is connected to other people. As that old expression goes, Roman Christians, uh, breaking bread Christians, no person is an island. Our lives are dedicated to God. We are owned by God. Therefore, whatever we do, we do it to the Lord because of Jesus, because of what he did for us. Christians, no, Christians should use their freedom in Christ to show love and respect to fellow believers, not arguing with them or trying to get them to change because he died, Jesus died for all people. 10 through 12. Okay, Ned, bend over. I've had my abdomen poked a few times. You're gonna poke your back now. Here comes L5, whatever it was. But why do you judge your brother, God says? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I'll explain that in a minute. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of my neighbor, no. my brother, my no. fellow church goer who doesn't live the way I live. No. Nope. Mm -hmm. Every person will give an account of himself to God. The use of judge and show contempt is obviously referring back to the, the meat eater, non-meat eater, the the Sabbath keeper and the non-Sabbath keeper. In any case, he's saying the attitude is wrong, whether you're judging or showing contempt, because we only have one judge and we're going to stand before that judge, the judgment seat of Christ one day, and we're going to give an account for only our actions. I'm not responsible for anyone else. There are people out there who, who just beat themselves up to death because their daughter or their son or their husband or their brother or their sister or their mother, and they could have done more and they should have done more to try to win them over to the Lord or, or whatever. I'm not saying don't try, but what I am saying is, nope, according to this, there's only one person you're going to have to give an accounting for, and that's yourself. So, Paul saying, in effect, now I'm not saying ignore your brother. He said just did the last passage, love them, but stop worrying about your brother and what he believes because you have enough to answer for before Jesus. I'm going to let that sink in a minute. Quit worrying about what your fellow brother and sister believe. you got enough on your plate as it is because you're going to have to answer for what you did and what you believe. Now, what is this judgment seat of Christ? On YouTube, I've got some people who are not um, far along in their walk with the Lord, and this might throw them a bit. I have to shift positions here. Um, the judgment seat of Christ is not, a youth of, well, Lynn, you told me that I'm saved and I'm never going to be judged for my sins, that Jesus just took them all on himself and I'm forgiven. Yes, you are. That isn't what this is referring to. In the original Greek, this was called the Bema seat, B-E-M-A, Bema seat of Christ. 
And, and uh, an illustration of what it meant is during the ancient Olympic games, um, there would be a judge at the seat of the Olympic games and the games, the, the event would be over and they would bring in the, the top three finishers of that event. And then the judge would assign first, second and third place and place crowns on their heads. That's what Bema seat is referring to. The Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ has nothing to do with judging you for your sins because Christ bore all your sins. You have no sins. What the Bema seat is about has only to do with what rewards you will receive in heaven. The crowns you will wear in heaven, the, the level of responsibility, your depth of understanding, um, your rewards in heaven. So you will give an account for your actions and you will give an account for what did you do with what I gave you? And you have the story of the, the guy who was given 10 talents and five talents and one talent. What did you do with your what God gave you? And you will have to give an account of that, but it only relates to the rewards you receive in heaven. And, and Paul is quoting this every knee shall bow is from Isaiah 45, 23. And it, it's just saying, listen, everybody needs to be humble and everybody's going to appear before Christ and give an account only of their own actions. So quit worrying about what your brother's doing. Okay, we're, now we close. Verse 13. Therefore, and I love this because in Ned's prayer, he used this phrase, stumbling block. Paul's going to use the same <laughs> phrase now. Therefore, and when you have to see a therefore, you know he's wrapping something up or he's, it's, it's there for a reason. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. See, this is going on. The ongoing, ongoing. Let us not judge each other anymore. But rather, and this is a command, resolve this, fix this, quit it, stop it, deal with it, handle it, so as not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in your brother's way. So you want to cause somebody to fall, you want to cause somebody to stumble, let's Let's highlight our differences and get into an argument about it and try to change one another. Paul says that's exactly where this leads. And he's exactly right because church history has borne that out. That's why we have eight bazillion different kinds of denominations, styles of worships and whatever. And at the end of the day, Paul goes, it doesn't matter. That stuff's minor stuff. Focus on loving one another and if you'd done that, there wouldn't have been all the differences. But even if there are differences, love one another. You should be able to go to a conference. You should be able to go to a breaking bread class. Know that there's people with some different views than yours. And you know what? Relax and not worry about it. And just talk about how good the meatloaf is today. Because that's what God wants you to do. He doesn't want you to argue over these points. He doesn't want you to get wrapped up in the minutia. Because why? It causes people to stumble and to fall. And that's not going to put you, I got to tell you, that's not going to put you on God's good side. You cause a brother to stumble or fall, God's not really happy about that. Just to, just to clue you in. So um, now, counterpoint. Well, does that mean if somebody's going off in the weeds or doing something wackadoodle that I'm not allowed to say anything to them? Nope, never said that. I said on minor points. And by the way, most of them are minor. Don't, don't get this screwed up in your mind. Your point is probably a minor point. The odds are 90% chance whatever you think's major is probably minor. But let's say they are, are like they're talking about Jesus really isn't the son of God or that we're all going to be like Jesus one day. And, and he's basically a man that's elevated himself like like the LDS church teaches. Now, and, and let's say it's something that is like, OK, this is not biblical. 
this goes outside the boundaries of mere Christianity. Romans 15, 14 says they can be admonished. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 2 says they can be rebuked. Right? Yeah. There is a role for discipline within the church on main issues, not on minor issues. And it better be a clear major scriptural issue that is not even controversial. It's like, well, nope. See, when C.S. Lewis wrote the book, Mere Christianity, he went out and, and had the, 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 uh, the first edition just scoured by every kind of Christian authority, whether uh, Catholic, uh, Protestant, all different, you know, evangelical Catholics, uh, conservative, uh, um, um, traditional Roman Catholics, uh, all different types of the Protestant denominations. And you know what they all said? Okay, yeah, you know, you got it. This is the basics of Christianity. This is what we all hang our hat on at the end of the day. If you get somebody that colors outside of those lines, the scripture says, yeah, you can rebuke them, you can correct them, you can admonish them, not to be mean to them, but try to get them back on the right path. But guys, I am telling you, the default is 99% of the time through church history. That's not what we've done. We've, we have majored on the minors. We've taken some minutia thing concerning baptism or, um, you know, I, I listed out a whole bunch of them at the beginning of the broadcast. And that becomes like the point at which we have to stand. And 2 Timothy 4, 2 says, I can rebuke you. No, it doesn't. Again, ignorant, ignorant, ignorant. Read your Bible. Read Romans 14. Paul says, fix it. I like fix it. Because as a dad, I remember when the kids were little and they were scrapping and, and you knew what they were arguing about was stupid. And all you wanted them to do was to get along. And you would just say, fix it before I have to fix it. Resolve it. And that's what God's saying here. Don't you be a stumbling block. Don't you be a stumbling block to your brother or sister. You fix this. So, in conclusion, at this Bema seat, at this Bema seat, all these meaningless, stupid, trivial differences between Christians will just instantly melt away. And you're not going to be concerned about what Joe Blow did sitting in pew three, because you yourself will be standing before Christ, giving an account of everything that you did for him. Again, not for sake of punishment, but for sake of rewards. The weaker doesn't have to defend the stronger, uh, the actions of the stronger, and the stronger doesn't have to defend the actions of the weaker. The only person you're going to be given an account of is your own life. So that's who you should be worried about. You shouldn't be sticking your nose in other people's business with all this other stuff because if you have a conviction that you shouldn't do something, then you need to live by that conviction. Uh, I was going to pick on Dana today. He's not here, so that's not proper to do that. But, but let's say, for instance, I don't have a, an, an issue with drinking, all right? And I, it's probably because A, I'm cheap, and B, I don't really like the taste of it. But it's not, it's like it provides no temptation to me whatsoever. So if I were to have, let's say, Shuggy and I go on a cruise when the pandemic's finally over and all that stuff, and I have a banana daiquiri on the Lido deck, and there's Captain Steubing running around in his white shorts, and I, and I have a, a mango daiquiri or a banana daiquiri. I'm not going to hell, guys. But that's a liberty and a freedom I possess. I could drink a banana daiquiri because actually that does taste good to me. All right. Beer doesn't taste good to me. Wine doesn't taste good to me. Hard alcohol, way too expensive. Why would anybody even bother? So I could have a banana daiquiri. But let's say, and, and I'm just going to use somebody that isn't here today. Let's say Joe Smith was on the broadcast and he's a recovered alcoholic. Now, A, he needs to listen to the convictions of his own mind. He shouldn't drink even a banana daiquiri, even on the Lido deck, even with Captain Steubing in white shorts standing there. He shouldn't drink a banana daiquiri. 
He needs to have the convictions of what God's placed on his heart. Now, Joe, Joe Smith doesn't need to look down his nose at me and go, God, you're like one step away from hell drinking that banana daiquiri. And I don't need to look at him saying, what a legalist. Have a drink. No, don't do that to each other, guys. God's saying, give each other latitude. Focus on your similarities, which are 95% of the same, and love on one another and quit trying to major on these minors. Um, so take yourselves off mute. Main message, a couple of quotes. <laughs> I've got three paragraphs and then I'm done. Conversation, that's just a couple of minutes. Paul lived in freedom. Paul lived in liberty. But Paul's understanding of freedom was characterized by a deep respect for his fellow believer. He would never, ever want to make them stumble. I, I, I know a pastor, a friend of mine, nobody here knows him, so you're good. He's from South Florida. And he, he may have a glass of wine occasionally, but he never drinks in public. And he never drinks around people he knows that are like coming out of Celebrate Recovery or one of the, the alcohol programs. And he does that because he loves and respects them. And he doesn't want to be a stumbling block to them. Paul clearly identified people who were bound up in external matters, and he called them weak Christians, that we're free to walk in Christ. But he clearly didn't say, you're to convince them otherwise, you're to argue with them, you're to split churches over it, they're not to be ridiculed, they're not to be treated with contempt, you're to treat them with love and respect, and respect their differences. And likewise, to the weaker Christians, he says, listen, you've got all these rules and regulations. Maybe you've got good reasons for doing it that aren't biblical. Don't be putting your, your shtick on somebody else. That's something God told you to do. Fine. You better do it. But don't be trying to impose that on Bill because it doesn't apply to Bill. If it did, I'd put it in my Bible. But it doesn't apply to Bill. So leave him out of this. This is between me and you. You walk the way I tell you to walk. Do you guys get all this? The kind of attitude Paul had would encourage unity. It would encourage harmony. It would encourage love within the church. So if you're in the libertarian camp, your liberty should always be regulated by love. Respect for your <clears throat> fellow believer. Closing, Corson had a couple things that I really liked and I I wanted to read a specific quote that he's, he had. He said, um, your love, your ability to love somebody else is probably going to be tested more by Christians who disagree with you than by unbelievers who persecute you. Now think about that. Mm -hmm. He said, because it takes a diamond to cut another diamond. And what do you do when your brother or sister disagrees with you about how you ought to live? And he said, well, that then brings in historically the most favorite of Christian indoor sports. And that sport is trying to change one another. And it's wrong. Do you realize, he says, that God doesn't care about a lot of things that we get upset about, fight over, and debate endlessly ad nauseum? The Father's agenda is a whole lot different than ours. Sad to say, the things that shock us most significantly are most insignificant when compared to the bigger issues of eternity. We become so engaged and embroiled in minuscule rules and regulations and political discussions and theological hair splitting that we miss the big picture entirely. He concludes, I'm convinced God doesn't care about most of the things that we debate and discuss and argue about endlessly. He's concerned about this. People being saved, brought into the kingdom, walking in the spirit, and growing in grace.
end quote. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought of a, a really good example of this. Um, you know, we've talked about this before, asceticism or giving up worldly goods. Um, it's a great closing illustration. There are those people who quote scripture and say, Jesus was right. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly as they slice into their ribeye steak, medium rare, because you ruin a ribeye if you cook it any more than medium rare. It's, anybody knows that. So, <laughs> you know, they're eating their, their ribeye and says, Jesus said, I have come that you may have life more abundantly. And then the guy you're sitting across the table with who's eating a dry salad, no dressing, will say, yeah, but didn't Jesus say that if a man were to come after him, he should deny himself as he looks at the, at the fat marbling on your ribeye? He should deny himself, take up the cross and follow him as he bites a piece of dry romaine. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> You see, guys, listen to me. They're both right. You got people who give up all their worldly goods, enter a monastery, and live this aesthetic, ascetic life of no worldly possessions. And you got some people who are whooping it up and rejoicing <laughs> and carefree in all their liberty and enjoying life that God blessed them with to the fullest. They're both right. Variety is the spice of life. God didn't make us all to be homogenous. These are not major issues. One way, man was convinced one way. One man was convinced the other. We should be counting this as a blessing. We can learn from both people. We can be enriched by both groups. We can rejoice with those who are very contemplative in their piety, as well as we can be uh, smiling at those who are carefree in their freedom. What phenomenal latitude and freedom God has given to us with him to interact with each other. So um, whether we live it up or whether we give it up, we still can glorify God. Okay. Now, if Ken was here, he'd want me to quote this. So it's an old church principle. It's been around for a bazillion years. And it's this. In essentials, major things. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In everything, love. Mm, that's great. Mm. All right. Yeah. Questions, comments. I'm done poking on my abdomen and and uh, and Ned's Bye. back for one day. <laughs> Feels pretty good. Do you see how we've not done a really good job with this, the church in general, for the last couple thousand years? I think it's interesting. Uh, it's a rough topic to mention right now, but uh, the history of the of Crimea or Ukraine, the reason that uh, Russia, the motherland, and Ukraine have a problem, it has to do with the Greek Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. And that's why you had the Crimean War. And this goes back a long time. That is that Ukraine was Catholic, while Russia and Greece were Greek Orthodox. And that's the conflict's been going on forever. And again, I mean, like you said, I mean, if they only knew, I mean, that what's important is know who Jesus is. Uh, no Romans, like you said, Romans 13. I mean, uh, uh, the wars that we have had for stupid things are because they're missing the major point. Yeah. And we're having one right now. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Give each other wide latitude, guys and gals.
because most of the stuff that we run into are non-essential. Steve? Steve, you're on mute, bud. Let me get him a second. Okay, you're, okay, you're off mute, but no, nope, you're okay. back on mute. Uh, okay. For some reason, I can't get, I can't hear you. Oh no, I'm not good at lip reading, Steve. So your your audio is not coming through for some reason. But you look great. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, buddy. He's gonna get frustrated with technology like Ned did the one time, so. Oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, if there's no further comments, questions, um, I'm gonna ask uh, Bill if you wouldn't mind closing us out in prayer. Thank you guys for sitting there and let, letting the scriptures poke on us a bit today. I know that was uh, maybe uncomfortable because I'm sure everybody, including myself, including the people listening on YouTube later, everybody has been guilty of some of this stuff. So we just need to be reminded, not, not cool, get along, get along, get along. All right, go, go ahead. Thank you, Lynn. Father, thank you for letting us know through this wonderful studies that we have, our get-togethers with Lynn and our fellow brothers in you, Lord. Um, the mercies that you have, how it is that we will have one day our rewards with you, Lord Jesus, that we're in the book of life. And it really doesn't make a difference. The little things that we think are so important, what's really important is that we have a relationship with you and that we love one another. And love conquers all, including our enemies, as well as our friends. And I thank you, Lord, that it is so simple that you have written it down for us in your word that we may know. And you, you have mentioned that your word is above your name. It's the most important. And for your spirit, you give us understanding. And you allow us, you allow us who are from different denominations, different upbringings, get together as one, as one church, as one body, as one head. And that's you, Lord Jesus. And I thank you so much for this day and for this lesson. And I pray, Lord, that you hear our prayers, those which have been mentioned, those which have not been mentioned, but you know which ones they are. And I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I will see you next week. We will finish chapter 14 next week. And uh, looking forward to it. It's going to be a similar theme, but a little bit different. And uh, hopefully we'll still get some meat out of that uh, next week. Oh, sorry, it said meat. So we'll get some we'll get some rutabagas out of that next week. So uh, we'll see you guys next Wednesday. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. bye.